yours too. <laughs> yes. So do you own this? I know. If you guys want us to move forward, I feel like um, we're not using mics and we're all seated, so it may be better to try to get close just because I feel like I talk really loud, but I'm not sure about everyone else. <laughs> Great. Yeah, there's a lot of empty seats like up at this table, up at this table, there's some up here. So yeah, just get closer. Let's get cozy and uh, you, can, you can put your notebook in your lap. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so I'm Amy Marsh and I am the literary director at Samuel French. Uh, so a lot of you have probably spoken to me via email or on the phone at some point. Um, I have a great group of our playwrights up here and people that have been associated with Awesome what we do at Samuel French. So I'd like really quickly for them to take a kind of a brief introduction, maybe talk about their plays or how they've worked with us. Um, one sentence, go. <laughs> uh, I'm Matt Hoberman, and I uh, was one of the winners of the, was it 2008? 2009? Maybe it was 2009. 2009, Samuel French, Broadway Festival. And the play The Student, which is the one that's being done here, and then from that, that's actually part of a collection of plays that wound up getting published by Samuel French, and it's done all around the country. Great. Uh, my name is Robert Kaisley. Um, I, I run the playwriting program at the University of Idaho, and Sam French published my play Front last year, and we'll be publishing my play Happy late, later this year. Yeah, it's close. It's very close. It's very close. <laughs> very close. <laughs> Uh, I'm Steve Yaki. Um, I had a, I guess I was one of the winners of the Sam French Short Play Festival in 2008. Yeah. And uh, actually in 2000. Mm -hmm. And um, and then since then, have had a really great relationship with them. I think I have six. Yeah. Publications right now with you guys. Yes, it's quite a few. I'm Debbie Archin. I participated in the Sam French Fest last October. Um, great, and so in addition to these guys, I just want to point out that there's actually more of our playwrights in this room. We're also people doing OB or have done OB or are going to be published. So can I just get a quick show of hands on so many people have a book with Samuel French or are doing the San French Festival or have done, yeah. So, yay, okay. Be proud, be proud. <laughs> That's awesome. For City uh, Theater, I am raising my hand. Yes, yes. And then in addition to that, I will also point out that we have um, this year's festival, which I'll talk about kind of at the end of our little presentation. We've actually used four plays, I think, that have come out of, we came to City Theater, or City Rights last year, talked to a lot of playwrights, read a lot of plays, and four plays from this upcoming festival um, originated with City Rights. That's how we got to know the playwrights. There's Mark Swanner yeah. right there. So I hope you raised your hand. <laughs> Bob and Brad. So I just, um, I want to take this next, we have, we're a little late, so we have 30 minutes maybe. You're fine. Great. So I, I, just to talk a little bit about what we do, and hopefully I can kind of answer some questions about publishing and the role of a publisher. Uh, in terms of your life as a playwright. But uh, we're a very old company. Most of you guys have heard us or read our plays or have, have Samuel French editions on your shelf. Uh, we started, I think the American office started in 1850. The UK office started in 1830. Um, we have about 9,000 active titles, titles that are, you can license them now. They are still in, under copyright. Uh, and I think the number of authors is even greater. It's something like 15,000 playwrights over the course of our history. So um, when people tell me that playwriting is a dead art, I'm like, really? I didn't. I had no idea because our catalog <laughs> is just so. It's great. It's really, really great, and it's very vibrant, and we get tons of submissions every year. Um, so I work. I think the best way to talk about what we do is to kind of frame it through the life of the book and the life of, a, of an author's journey with us kind of through the door and then through publication and actually through marketing. Uh, we are a publishing and licensing house, so uh, we uh, print actually as a result of licenses we do for plays. Our books are actually guides that tell production companies how to do plays. So if you're looking to get things published, there's actually a range of types of publications for playwrights. You have trade publishers like TCG, and Smith and Krauss and Meriwether, 
who do kind of academic guides of your plays or reading copies. You know, they'll do like the, the our town that you study in classrooms. Whereas our version of our town actually has like the sound effect list and how those go into the script. Um, those lovely set designs that I'm actually kind of trying to phase out. But and I'm getting to remember the early editions where it's stick pin and handwriting and it's like a circle and it's this chair. Uh, <laughs> those were, in, in terms of Samuel French's history, those were actually the blueprint for smaller amateur groups to, you know, to know how to produce a play and to do it, um, you know, to honor the playwright's intentions in doing that production. So we were really the, the framing device on plays that, that came in. We put you know, we made sure that playwrights' ideas were preserved, that their intentions were honored. And of course, that varies from playwright to playwright even today. Some people are very strict with how you do their plays. Um, there are some authors that every time a show gets licensed, we have to call them and clear it with them. And some people, I think, um, I won't say who it is, but there's one that actually requires to look at headshots. Um, <laughs> yeah, Everybody knows who it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people know who it is. But, um, <laughs> you know, and then there are others that are like, I mean, I mean, maybe some of you could speak to this, but it's actually who want different interpretations of their plays and who are open to different interpretations. So people that don't even use stage directions really because they believe it's, it's the director's prerogative and that all happens in production. Um, so the way you submit to French, and I'll kind of talk about our general things, and then maybe some of you could tell your submission stories, or how you, know, you came to, to French. Uh, but we have right now, it, it, <laughs> submission stories. Um, we, have, we do not currently accept unsolicited submissions. So like a lot of play publishers and uh, regional theaters and, and such. We take query letters, uh, 10 page samples, uh, and then in that query letter, there's, there's several things that we ask for. So production history, um, your bio, you know, why you think it should be published, why it's the right time for you. Uh, this isn't unusual at all, and, and I actually am a huge believer in transparency. I think it's really good for any lit office to try to be upfront about the needs of the company and, and why you're submitting. And so, um, you know, on our website right now, we actually have things that we're not looking at. Um, and you know, all of that is basically for curatorial reasons. Like, we're not taking holiday plays at the moment. And that's just because we published six last year. Like, feasibly, we have to get those out to companies and kind of let them saturate the market before we take any new, new holiday plays. I'm not sure if I'll ever lift the ban on Christmas Carol. I think we have 17 versions of Christmas <laughs> Carol in our catalog. So um, you know, if you're thinking about doing an adaptation of Christmas Carol, it's, it's really for your benefit, too. You want your play to have a place in a catalog and really get individualized attention. Um, so I think before you're submitting, it's always a good idea to be like, what's in the vein of what I have written? Um, who publishes that play? Do I want to be with that play? Would that help it? Or do I want to be, you know, if you wrote a fairy tale adaptation, like a TYA play, Who's the best? Who's doing TY scripts really, really well? You know, how many fairy tale plays do they have? Are those plays getting licensed? Often on publishers' website, you, you can look up that information. On our website currently, we have a now playing calendar where you can see what's playing and how many productions it's getting. Um, DPS's website, they have a page to stage. You can look up how many how many publications or what publications are getting produced where and how many productions there are. So it's kind of in your best interest to find the publisher that's going to be the right fit and really can, uh, you know, that really has a unique place for you in their catalog. So you're not just getting lumped into a bunch of Christmas carols and, and then your play gets lost and, and that's the end of it. Um, so yeah, so if you'd submit, you'd email your script to me, um, we look it over, if we think that it's a good fit for us or if we feel like there's, we want to have a further conversation, we request the full script, that comes in. Um, if you have representation or a lawyer, often we'll, we'll take full manuscripts straight from them directly, which I think is how you guys, most of you guys have representation, right? Yeah. So yeah, for, um, in Robert's case, like, Marta Prager is the one that's sent on front to me. And that actually sat with us for quite a while, I think. I think maybe I have the record. I think seven years. Yeah, it's actually yeah, seven, actually seven years. I think so. Yeah. But but the, you know the two the two titles that I have with you both very different kind of submission stories. Uh, the first play Front, I wrote, you know, back in 1990, 
two or three. I mean, a long time ago. And my agent was just kind of get, getting it out there and getting productions that way. And then after a decade, decided to submit it. And, um, uh, and then it was just published last year. So from 1992, so in other words, patience is a virtue, not just spelling the playwright, but patience as well. Whereas Happy, I think I, I sent it, I wrote it, and within a year, I, um, within that year, I sent it to you, and you, you folks responded within a, a couple yeah. of weeks, if I recall. Yeah, I can say that, um, actually, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up, because I kind of, I like to tell players out there, like, oh, how do I get my play published, and what, you know, what, it, what is it, how do I get it published? It's actually a, a large question and something that plagues us in our office is um, timing. You know, a lot of publications about timing and where the script is in its own life. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't need publication. Like, is there a place for it? I think with Front, and I'll be totally candid, we had some talks with, with Marta. Um, when it came in, we all loved it and we were very enthusiastic about it. But we had just published a number of scripts that we felt like would compete with it. Um, and so we were like, can we hang on to this? We're going to and strategically like we can't let the baby go right. we want to like keep the baby in the office but um we'll contact you you know maybe when it's a better time and and we think there's really something we can do and that's that's what happened it just right. took a very long time and admittedly french has had some new administrations and every time that happens there's a bit of an educational we have to go back and look at those scripts and i was it is it still is it still worth it you know should we hang on to it further with happy um that's a case where that's a national new play network um, play and it had six productions in a year. We knew there was a lot of people talking about the play. We wanted it. To, we wanted to make it available while people were talking about it, and so um, we thought it better to act immediately and get it into print so that when we sent it out to theaters to license, it was all fresh. You know, they knew about it. It was. It was very like okay. And with front, you know, it's that too. We've been sending it to many theaters, but there is more of an educational arm with it, and we have to really be selective about who we send it to. Like I think yeah. we've been targeting colleges and some adventurous high schools, and yeah. yeah. It's big. It's big. Yeah. Um, so I will say, you know, with your own scripts, if there's something you feel, publishers do look for commercial heat. Um, that is a term that I throw around a bit. Uh, but it's, if there is a play that you have that you feel like people are talking about it, and you're getting licensing requests for it, people are emailing you and saying, how do I do this? How do I cut it up? Um, yeah, that is a really good time to contact a publisher and be like, hey, I need, I need help handling these, or I think it's a really good, you know, I'm getting six requests a year, and there's all these little theaters I think would, would be interested. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really good reason to contact someone. Also, if you have a play for a very specific market, and there's a market need for it, for example, I just want to do something, we got so many requests for bullying plays the past two years, every um, high school in the country. And also vampire plays. You might be like, oh, what's my next play? I mean, the vampire requests have kind of dwindled these past couple of years, but for a while, all these teachers at conferences were like, yeah, do you have anything that's kind of like Twilight? Because that's what my kids want to do. And what's the vampire? Yeah. Sorry. That's exactly what we should do. Um, we have, uh, yeah. We have other avenues that people come to us through too, in addition to the queries and to agent submissions and their relationship with us. We also have a number of partnerships and sponsorships throughout the country. For example, we published the winner of The Princess Grace and we published the Weisberger winner. And um, so I always encourage people, the more, the more awards and competitions, the better. There are some that strategically come to with the option to publish at the end. So if that's something you're interested in, you can, you can target those. Um, we also have OOB. Uh, which is how three of you, well, Matt, if you yes. want to talk about your submission story. Oh, sure. <laughs> well, I just, uh, I, I don't know if, the, if OB is still this way, but you need a, a theater to nominate you. I don't know if you, yeah. can, you can most self-nominate now, Theaters can self-produce, yeah. Self-produce, but at the yeah. time that I applied, you had to have a theater, so there's a theater in town called the Algonquin Productions, and they, they submitted my play, and it got chosen, and we performed it, and then it wound up winning, which was great. But it was this play, the student is, I had, I had this idea um, because I was having trouble getting my shows done and I was like, you know, everybody's competing for, there's like five shows in a season and everybody's competing for the four slots and there's the holiday slot and there's Christmas Carol and if you're a smaller theater, um, eight reindeer, um, reindeer monologues, Tuna Christmas and David Sedaris play. So I wrote, uh, so I wrote five uh, short comic uh, Christmas plays and this was one of them and so uh, when it won and it got published, then I made a pitch to you guys to 
produced the whole evening of Christmas plays, which you did. And it's been pretty successful. It's been pretty successful. And yeah. you want to show my little box? Yeah, I do. Well, I wanted to get to marketing. All right, okay. So that, that'll be like, he has a There's visual aid. There's something coming that's going to be really yeah. exciting. Yeah. Um, and Steve, you also came to us kind of through OOP. Um, yep. But do you want to talk a little bit about that? Or um, uh, like what, you, what had you been doing before OOP? Like how was it? I was, at, I was in graduate school at NYU, and we uh, like had the opportunity through a uh, vital theater company in New York who produces a lot of, or who used to produce a lot of short work. Um, and uh, just got a really fun group of people together and did this really weird play about terrible, terrible, terrible things <laughs> happening in a small town in the middle of nowhere. That's just three like overlapping monologues and I thought, like, no one's gonna. <laughs> No. Listen to this, and um, <laughs> and uh, and it won, which shocked so us. Cool. Um, <laughs> and so then I think, but coming out of coming out of grad school, I had two plays that had both had two productions and had done pretty well. Octopus and this other play, Cartoon. And I think you guys requested Octopus, and my agent sent Octopus and Cartoon, and was like, "Hey, he's got this other play also." Mm -hmm. And um, and then they were like, "We want to publish." Octopus, and my agent was like, well, you can only have Octopus if you also publish Cartoon, oh. and they worked out this whole thing where, like, Sam French was like, fine, we'll do that, but, like, uh, what was it? Play. No, 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 it was that like, they tied the two plays yeah, together. There's something called cross-collateralizing, um, which we, we love, both publishers and licensors love it, where to recoup in advance, we tie the two plays together, so <coughs> one play, you know, if one play pays off its advance against performance royalty, the money it makes will go towards the other play until both of them are paid and off. And what's great about that yeah. story, though, is that, like, Octopus has been done <laughs> maybe eight times, which is cool and really great productions, and that one's been done sort of, like, in different places around the world. Cartoon's been done, like, 30-something <laughs> times, like, <laughs> by all different levels of theaters, like, colleges and universities do it regular community theaters do it, like professional yeah. theaters do it, and everyone just kind of goes to town with that play. Yeah. It's yeah. usually like the first play of mine that gets done in a new city, like in a new market, and then people go and kind of seek out my other work. Yeah. So it's just funny how that worked out. It is really funny. Yeah, and that shows you, I guess the moral there is that, you know, sometimes what publishers say is not the be all end all, and we try to know our markets really well, but, you know, Octopus, or uh, Cartoon probably would have gone on and had, you know, regardless of what we decided. This is just great. a bizarre play. Like. But I will say to you about Octopus, and, you know, this was back when I was an associate at the company, is we were getting so many people writing us and telling us about Octopus. Like, we were hearing things on the LMDA board all the time, people, we, we track. We, we hunt for playwrights. Like that's a large part of my job is reading message boards and looking at season announcements and calling up other lit managers and asking them who are they excited about, who, who's going up in their season. And people kept telling us, oh, have you seen this by Octopus? It's amazing, he's really young, someone needs to put him into print. And I think we're like, we gotta call up his agent and ask for the script. So that's another way, actually, to get the attention of a publisher, is, is just get your work out there, get done, get people talking about you, try to secure professional recommendations. Um, I've actually had a lot of publications come through other playwrights, playwrights that we already published have talked to me and said, oh, you know, there's, there's a writer that I'm working with or who's in my class, um, I'm really, really excited about them, you have to come to this reading. Uh, and that kind of recommendation can get you pretty far. I, I love getting my inbox full of you know, read about this person, see this person's work. Um, so that's very exciting. But I wanted to go on and talk a little bit about what happens after we acquire a play. Um, yeah? Oh, well, I'm going to circle back to OOB. Oh, oh, would, oh. You, the, would you, yeah, when you get to OOB, because there were some, there was some rustling over here. What is OOB? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> It's so the Samuel French Off Off Broadway Short Play Festival. It's the largest, I just assume that people know about it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the oldest and largest continuous short play festival in the United States. Um, it's, it could started in 78, and so we're in our, I don't know what year we're in. It's um, 38 or something, so I guess that my math is wrong, sorry. Um, but a lot of our playwrights have come out of there. We published Teresa Rebeck's first play in OOB. Um, 
We published Shirley Laro, a version of Open Admissions, which she went on and wrote a full length. It was on Broadway, it was Tony nominated, and that, that early version of the play was actually in like the third year of the Off Broadway Festival. That's where she had it published. Um, we, it was outsourced for a long time to a company called Love Creek, and then we took it back in-house the past couple years. So I think for the past six years, the Samuel French staff had an epiphany that we were all theater practitioners that worked in licensing, and that we could actually run a really great festival if we rolled our box leaves and did it. So we've been doing the festival. I also function as the literary coordinator for that festival. Billy Davis, who was here with me last year, she's a incredible stage manager. She's the festival coordinator and also by day our licensing development manager. So it's, it's very, we all, this is a night, night job almost, it's our passion and we get off the clock in the office and then go straight to the theater and, and produce these plays. And we invite, it's kind of American Idol format, so we have three judges. Um, we're kind of playing with the format a bit this year, so in the past it's been certain types of industry. This year we're kind of taking that type hat off of the judges, and so it can be actors, directors, um, people who are playwrights. We have a lot of playwrights judge. Um, but but agents. respected <laughs> agents, we've had agents, although this year I don't think we're having Probably. agents judge, yeah. Um, but respected industry professionals whose opinions we value, and, and they come and they watch six plays a night, they choose one or two to move on, and then we have the finals, and there will be 12 plays on the finals, we choose six for publication and licensing. So that is, you know, we publish short plays um, from Matt and Steve. Deborah did the festival last year, so Deborah's on our radar from here on out. We consider her a member of the family. Um, it's a lot of culty, actually. Like once you do the <laughs> Broadway festival, we're like, you're a family member. That's, actually, that's really true. <laughs> it is, and you get to know us really well because we're at the bar every night after the show, <laughs> dancing, and you're like, wow, those Samuel French people have no friends. <laughs> they're like so uncoordinated. But they also do this. They do this thing. They do this thing where they like stand up at the bar, like on a chair, and announce to the cast and playwrights of all of the participating plays which two are moving on. So you're like all in the room together, drinking and having a good time, and then they like crush the night for a bunch of <laughs> But then like two, two playwrights in their cast are like, woo! And it's like this, it, it creates this immediate like sifting effect in it. But I have to say that like many people, I mean it is like. No, it's great, it's social, it's fun. And I, and I was just yeah. saying that I, I mean, when you were doing it, when Love Creek was doing it, I had two plays that made it to this. Then it was different. Now you just choose the top 40 yeah. and do it in a week. It used to be with Love Creek, it was like the top 300 or something. Yeah. And it was over a couple of weeks. It went on forever. Yeah, yeah. it did. It really was. It's much yeah. more, it's much more better organized now. But I had a couple that didn't make it to the finals. And so, you know, you just keep coming back. And well, and I think that's it is we don't, um, you know, you see a lot of people who have been in the festival before and not made it, and the next year they come back and make it. Um, and people that are in the festival that don't move on, um, you know, we've gone on to publish their plays because you always have, once you're in the festival, you have an open door relationship with us. Um, it's like, I know who you are, I'll go to your readings, you know, the staff goes to your readings, we, we love you, we're so proud of you. So it's, it gets very, like I was saying family, but I actually use that term in earnest, like Samuel French loves to support the people that, because we're helping you produce this play, ultimately, so we feel very invested. And can um, I just say that, I know some, sure. some people were asking about, like, how, or some my friends just got into it this year, and they're like, how, you know, you're self-producing, how much is involved in that? It's really not that hard no. to self-produce your play, because you're really, it's very minimal, Every, you know, you get a, it's a few set pieces, you just have to find a place to rehearse, we get your actors, the set and pieces like, yeah, yeah, so it's very... It's not at all, what Summer Shorts does is the, you know, the coma, it's, it's amazing <laughs> for us, it's like, oh, that's... What we do, it's, I tell people it's it's not a stage reading because there are no scripts in hand, but we've had companies show up and they're like, oh yeah, we just put it together in our living room last night. <laughs> and you're like, okay, well, we, we hope it works. <laughs> yes. Um, I, yeah, I just want to, I want to add something about that because I got, I was able to go up and, and, and be on the judging panel this year since we've started this relationship being believers in the short play genre and being believers in visibility for playwrights and opportunities for playwrights, it's, it's kind of a wonderful thing because, for example, we, as we had 
cooked up our relationship a little bit. They had given me the galleys of the plays that had won the previous year, um, which had included this play, Bedfellows, which we wound up producing last year in Summer Shorts, if you remember, that was it was John Adams and Ben Franklin in the band. That was that play, okay? Uh, but meanwhile, they, we had also gotten Matt's play. We had gotten Matt's play from Samuel yeah. French and from Matt and from like everywhere else. And we were holding on that play to see when we were going to do it. This turns out to be that summer. But uh, that, it, that we're finally doing it. And we don't care if it's Christmas. We don't care. You know, That's June is June. Yeah. But, but the other part of it is, is that is where I met Deborah, And she actually then sent me another play altogether from the one that I had seen at the reading. And that is the play that has become a finalist this year because of friends and family, I guess, now, or new association. Yeah. Um, and then Katya uh, McMullen, who is, where are you? I'm here. Oh, boy. She, had, she has a lovely play, which you will be hearing in the readings as well, either Friday or Saturday, I'm not sure which. But the good news around it is that we're all invested in the same thing. And as you all are here as playwrights, for example, you all have, if, if you are city rights playwrights, you can give us directly two short plays, directly to us, ahead of our, ahead of our submissions. And Amy and I go back and forth with what that is. And again, as she said, last year she saw four plays in summer shorts and, and wanted them, they, they made it, they made it on to yeah. what they're doing and hopefully she'll see some more this summer that she will want to, to do that with. Well, and I actually too, I think last year even we took submissions directly out. Yes, you did. Of, I mean, I, I left the festival with like a packet of 30, 30 plays and people out of city rights have emailed me plays to consider for the festival. They'd like, oh, I'd like these to be in consideration. So actually I have a sign up here too, which I'll have all weekend long. If, if you want more information about the festival or the application and when it becomes available for next year, um, I'm happy to send you that. And we have an application fee now. We didn't use to, but it's another conversation. Um, we waive that fee for you guys as, as conference participants. Um, so. Plays. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can, um, can I just say yeah, real, sure. real quick, like, I immediately agreed to come here when Susie and Nan were like, hey, do you want to come down for this? I immediately agreed because I am, I'm like a champion, a really loud, like, not even champion's not the right word, I'm annoying about how, uh, a, uh, an annoying proponent of short work. Um, and like lots of times you sort of hear uh, people say, well, you know, there's not a lot of venues for short work, or there's not a lot of opportunity, you know, and so, like, <coughs> would my time be better spent somewhere else? But a really strong short play can be a fantastic calling card, and also open a lot of doors in situations like this, like the one that you're in right now. And so I uh, just got up on my soapbox a little bit, but I just think, like, <laughs> this is so, I'm, that's one of the reasons I was so excited to come down here, is because um, short work for me ended up being, the, you know, like the, the first year I did the San French Festival, I won. The second year, I'm not allowed to do it anymore. I can't, there's some rule. We do no published authors. That's the other thing, too. We put it in place because people were accusing us of nepotism and favoritism. <laughs> They're like, oh, it's always your authors that win. <laughs> so we actually decided to be like, this is our open door to new writers who we do not have an existing relationship with. Because you guys, I mean, whatever, I hang out with you all. <laughs> You know, but we want we want new voices, new faces, and new. And we've actually talked about you know, you know, representation and what are the requirements there. And I think we limit people now to two plays, two submissions of these. So it, it's um really about putting our best foot forward and also just meeting the company and getting to know our our team. So yeah, um, I did want to follow up. I know we have we're crunched for time, so I might I have a one on one session that's um, tomorrow. And if you have questions, if you want to meet with me then and talk, let's do that. But for now, I just want to cover a little bit about publication and what that looks like. And then also, I want to show, I think you're going to be like the, the grant surprise. <laughs> um, but we have, I brought in two books by our authors, um, Very Still and Hard to Sue D. Wow, very still and hard to see, which is actually, it's a, well, do you want to describe this? I don't need to, necessarily. Uh, it's a, a, 
Oh, do I have to hold it? <laughs> 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 I'm currently running. It's a, my favorite thing about Sam French now is that you can uh, you can ask them to use specific artwork as a cover thing, which makes me uh, super happy because it really helps things pop off a shelf in a way that acting editions don't. But um, I sound like a spoke for some reason. But um, this was a this is a play that is a, sort of a cycle of ghost stories based on. Um, sort of Japanese folk tales, but they all take place in a modern hotel that's probably somewhere like Miami, but mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then that's the first, that's the second half of the book. The first half of the book is nine, ten minute plays, like nine yeah. short plays. This is my second, so basically it's my second collection of short work from San yeah. French. Cool, and then I bought Robert's Front too, which also has a great image. I think the image that we used was the poster for a Philadelphia production. Yeah. We yeah. tracked down, the guy was in school at the University of the Arts, yeah. and he designed it. And we tracked him down, I forget how we tracked him down, but uh, he was quite happy to get his, his yeah. design on the <laughs> cover of the book. Uh, uh, front, is, it takes place in London during the Blitz of World War II. It's about a group of women who uh, work in a munitions factory and decide to sabotage the production of shell casings. Yeah. yeah. So I will say what's really interesting, I mean, we obviously pointed out the graphic covers, but I think that's a really good springboard to talk about, you know, what you should be thinking about when you write about plays a little bit. Uh, Marie, I don't, I don't know if that made sense, but I think it's a really good, like, Steve has a very interesting approach to publication because I think he thinks of it from the get-go, like from the time he puts, like, the pen on the page, and maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I think it's always in like what that final book looks like. Actually, when you send me plays now, he often sends me a cover image to go with the submission. I was like, this is what I was thinking. And we love it, because we're like, oh, we can picture that. And as a publisher, it's a very attractive thing. But just in terms of the interior of the book, too, also thinking of you know, how is your idea, if, if someone else wants to do your play and you're not involved in that production, how are your ideas like preserved and communicated? Mm -hmm. um, if there is a really specific set design you like and you want to use it, have you asked the set designer like, oh, down the road, can I use this as an example? Or we have a great playwright, Crystal Skillman, who is everyone knows her. <laughs> she's she's a she has a big personality. But she when we did her book, she really really wanted. She's like, I have these amazing directors that I want to give credit to. Can they all write forwards? And so the, the cut actually has three different essays from directors about how they approached the material and how they spoke to the actors. And um, yeah, she pulled in her friends and she said, you know, I want to give them credit and I want this to be a really holistic reading experience for the licensees. So they know, okay, that's exactly how she meant to approach this text. Um, and that's not even, you know, she's not talking production design. She's almost trying to preserve aesthetic. You know, it's a, it's a, she does write, her writing's a little far out, and, but she knows which parts are sincere, which parts are supposed to be comical, what the, what the play is supposed to sound like and feel like, and that's what she was really trying to speak to with that book. So I think that's a very, you know, thinking of preservation of your ideas from the time you start writing the play, or at least until the play starts to shape up is a really important thing. Um, and in the back of mine, I have right, some topical okay. references in my comedies, and I'm like, as these things age, because there's some time, yeah. you know, it hears like here's how to replace them with like yeah 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is also really important too. That's um, I think so many people are writing about like Facebook and iPhones and social media, and um, it's a challenge for us because we are like in ten years that may totally shift. Like MySpace plays, which I got when I first started working at the company, <laughs> MySpace is no longer around. It's coming back. <laughs> yeah, it's come back, it's come back. Um, but thinking about that, the longevity of the play, you know, is this something that, uh, how do I preserve this idea in 10 years? You know, do I do these jokes still stand up? You know, if I'm asking them to play Jay-Z, is that because it takes place in a certain era or that's a certain feeling? Will that feeling last later down the road? Um, and then lastly, I know we only have a couple more minutes, but I just wanted to talk on the same note kind of about marketing your work. Um, and also what, what happens kind of after a book is published. So we go through this editing process, um, and then we come to the front, we put it out there, we email all the theaters, we get licensing. I normally have meetings with people, I bring them in, and then we talk, okay, what are your friends' theaters that we should send this to, who should we target, who's turned, you know, where, where's this play been, where hasn't it been? 
Um, but then we also talk a lot about you know ways to really make it stand out in the sea of things that's out there. Let's let's work on marketing it. Um, I always recommend that writers have websites. If you don't have a website, get one. It is like your card. It is more impactful than having a card. The first thing I do when I get a submission is Google someone. And so being able to find information about you online uh, shows me that you have some kind of presence out there. Um, we like, it's much like conventional publishing. Nowadays, a writer almost has to have a fan base and a following. So the publishers really know, like, okay, we don't have to build this person up. It's already there, and we can move on that momentum. Um, so the more work you've done in terms of putting, getting a name for yourself and really that's that's great. That's great for us, and it goes a long way. You know, I mean, Steve, you have a gorgeous website, right? It's like. It's, I mean, it's okay. Yeah, it, I think it's gorgeous, and it's become like a calling card. I really feel like people go. There's lovely production photos. It's really lush. It's really, you know, I think there's lots of video of your work online. Matt has. I mean, you have quite a following from your solo teaching. Right. And so we've been able to like kind of play into that and be like, oh, you know Matt Heberman and his work, and let's send you this collection. Um, I also, okay, so now we can show the, okay, so sure. occasionally we do encourage people to do um, kind of, I don't know the word for it, but like extraordinary marketing things for their plays. I like extraordinary. Ex it's extraordinary. <laughs> um, and Matt and us worked on this great campaign for Christmas shorts together that I do want to show you. So you have to know, first of all, that my dad is a marketing company, so like I grew up being trained in this, but um, I'm a very self-promotional writer, and so I think because of, because I was marketing, I, from the beginning, this was marketed towards a particular mar you know, market and idea and time of year. I went into the American Theater Magazine, I looked in the back, the December issue, where they, where they, pop, where they name all, you know, what, what theaters are doing, what shows, and I made a list of 100 theaters that were doing plays like Christmas, that I thought would be a market for Christmas shorts. And then I came up with this, and I sent, we sent this to 100 of them. So they got this box like this, and then they opened it up, and it says, there are two kinds of Christmas shorts. And then you open this up, and there's a pair of uh, ho 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 underwear. And it says, here's one, and then here's the other. And it was a copy of my script with a, with a bookmark with all the licensing information. It's amazing. Oh, it's really cool. It's great, but all right. Okay, so it's like this. We're going to have it on display, but it's. And then you. Yeah, and then you see there's this underwear. Yeah. And then you got the script on the other side. Yeah, and then we got like great, you know, you got great feedback. So like artistic directors were wearing the underwear all day. <laughs> <laughs> and we actually, I don't think Matt knows this, maybe you know this, but we actually just picked up Hands on a Hard Body, the Broadway show, and we actually borrowed that idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> we were so inspired and we were like, this is a show that, you know, it had, it closed early and we wanted to make sure that, you know, the perceptions of it were still really strong, so we ended up sending out, you know, the CD in a, in a box and said, you know, with a script and we're like, this is hands on a hard body to all these artistic directors. So I think like sometimes taking that extra step, while there are certain artistic directors that will not gel with it and be like, Sam French is crazy, but, you know, it's also a really good way to get on people's, most people are flattered, I think, most people are like, wow, you really put a lot of time, you researched my theater and this is, this is really, I'm sure you could, you could describe Feeling. I know it. <laughs> yeah. So, do we have time for a couple questions? Well, no. <laughs> it's over. I feel. I feel bad. Sorry. Right. Actually, I participated in Sam French Fest last year, so I know there's some participants here. So I'm around this conference. If anyone has any questions. Yeah, Deborah later, actually, she did the most current festival and and had a lovely, lovely piece in our festival. So she'd be a great resource. Well, let's do this. Let's take five minutes, and then we're going to do the switch over to the next thing. Okay, but go ahead. Go yeah. Ahead. So does someone have real quick questions? I, they wanna? If sure. I submit the ten-page query and all the information that you required. And I get a rejection. Can I at least submit at another time, or once you reject it, that plays off the shelf forever? I think not necessarily, but really the resubmission has to be like justified. Either the play has to be rewritten, or um, there has to be some big like maybe you just got three other productions, and you're like I've developed it further. Okay. It's a different submission, mm -hmm. you know. And occasionally people will send me things and be like I rewrote it, but it's actually just a couple lines. Like we we know, and we know when something is is right, and also when it's not right. And I think. It's sometimes it's about quality. It's not always, and and actually, less often it's about quality. It's more about the fact that we have like a competing play in the catalog, mm -hmm. or we we published a lot of things this year, and we just don't have the. It seems like the best way in is through your OB. 
Yeah, for short plays, definitely. Um, for full length plays, of course, OOB isn't really right. uh, an option. But, uh, but it gets for me full in the family. What was that? But it gets me in the family. It does, it does, <laughs> exactly. And for full length plays, I would say the best way is really to try to secure some good productions of those plays, get people talking about it, get good reviews, mm -hmm. um, submit those. I mean, theaters. We can't take work that isn't production tested because publishing things without production, I mean, you're not totally sure that it works, neither are we. And people don't look to license world premieres. They want to do them at their own theaters. But you mean big productions, big yeah. cities. Yeah, yeah, or at least, at least like real, you know, coverage of the play. Okay. Like we need to know that there is a commercial, that people are going to come to us and we can say, you know, we have a new play by Steve Gawke, and people are like, oh, I, I love Steve Gawke's plays, and we're like, great, we'll send it to you. So it's, it's harder for us to do that if we're like, well, you know, it was produced at one college, and, and for them it's like, oh, how is this going to sell seats for me? Like, that, that it really is what theaters ask us a lot, so, yeah. Any other? Yeah. Do writers come to you with uh, lawyers? in tow or do you have in-house lawyers that we do them? have an in-house lawyer we have a, a business affairs department um, when you get to the contract stage they draft the contract often lawyers are involved with submission but once a play gets on the contract stage and then we've accepted it for publication and send you a contract that's when the dramatist guild or lawyers come into play a lot and we go back and forth about what's really the best terms for the play you know what meets the needs of our company what meets the needs of the author and it's, it's a dialogue that happens, yeah. Um, cool, any other questions about OV or San Branch or, yeah, Mark? Yeah, uh, I was just wondering what, what your take on um, the sort of uh, play publishing in the digital age. Oh yeah, I didn't really talk about ebooks. It's, um, it's an interesting thing, I mean, we're trying very hard to, we just entered e-publishing about two or three years ago. We started working with Apple and we're on that platform for a long time. And now we're you know, everywhere, we're on Kindle, we're on. Um, I have to say, we thought the demand for e-plays would be a lot higher than it has been. The sales have been actually really slow for us, but I do still believe that it's going to be the way people get plays in the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, and really actually what we didn't anticipate as a side effect is it's been great in terms of preserving the play, because no longer do we have artistic directors that say, I need it immediately, like, please send it to me, can't you just send it via email? You know, we're like, well, this is actually available online, and you can go and, and purchase it. So it's been more, yeah, I mean, it's been interesting. We'll see how it develops. I think there's lots of exciting things happening right now. We're, um, some of our biggest states were actually talking about, like, enhanced ebooks with them. And so for Agatha Christie right now, I know we're trying to put together a kind of a dramaturgical e-script where you'd be able to look at pictures of Christy and her bio while you're reading it and her music and so there's there's lots of cool things happening. It's just it's very young. It's very young. Tell everyone to buy e plays. That's okay. Yeah. And you sign a separate well, I you don't did. know if that's now you sign a separate contract. Yeah, now it's a part of the contract. Oh, okay. So it's it, when we first started it was actually like a uh, amend them to the agreements, um, and it was optional. I think it still is optional, but it takes some dialogue with us. So now it's in the contract that you sign, um, unless you don't want it to be there, and then your lawyer would come back and be like, no, we don't want to do that, so, yeah. Okay, can everybody give a nice round of applause?